test coming up on bipolar disorder? Mm, confused about lithium? What about antipsychotics? Do non-pharmaceutical therapies work? Don't worry. I have everything laid out for you to pass your test. Ready? Let's learn psych fast. Lithium is a gold standard for treatment of bipolar type 1. It's great for manic episodes and stopping those SI effects. But it's not just for manic episodes, as it also works on depressive symptoms too. The anti-manic effects can take effect within one to two weeks, so antipsychotics like benzos can be used as an adjunct therapy during this time. The antidepressant effect may take six to eight weeks to actually kick in. You will most certainly get a test question regarding its narrow therapeutic window, so let's make sure you understand everything about it. The half-life is 20 to 24 hours, and it's excreted 95% unchanged by the glomerular filtration, so it makes sense that anything that could affect the GFR will affect the clearance of lithium. Steady state takes about five to six days. Initial dosing is 600 to 800 milligrams per day divided into doses, and then you just titrate up depending on the response. The maintenance dose is based on serum concentration, symptom relief, and occurrence of adverse effects. Before starting a person on a lithium, do a workup. Draw that CBC, CMP, look at their electrolytes, their renal function, pull the thyroid panel, do a urinalysis, do an ECG, especially if that person's over the age of 50. Also do a pregnancy test. You want to do a pregnancy test because lithium is teratogenic, especially in that first trimester. So women of childbearing age should be counseled on the potential effects it could have on the fetus. Another part of the education is on its adverse effects because when that patient comes in for their one to two week follow-up and they're complaining of all these various symptoms and they want to start lithium, you want to counsel them accordingly. You know, some of the most common effects are GI. That's nausea, diarrhea, abdominal bloating. Uh, they could have tremors like Parkinsonosium, uh, polyuria, renal toxicity, a goiter, hypothyroidism, and of course, the teratogenesis, as previously stated. If a rash or psoriasis worsens, you might want to discontinue that drug temporarily to test the response, but sometimes you might just have to stop it permanently. If tremors occur, you can reduce the dose and or add a beta blocker. Of course, if there is CNS toxicity being seen in, by agitation and confusion, reduce the dose. GI symptoms typically resolve by reducing a dose or trying an extended release product or splitting the dose. If hypothyroidism develops, prescribe levothyroxine and then discontinue lithium if necessary. If polydipsia or polyuria occur, again, reduce the dose, but also encourage them to maintain proper fluid intake. And sometimes what works is just giving them a single dose at bedtime. If interstitial fibrosis or glomerular sclerosis occurs, you want to keep them at the lowest possible dose for efficacy and advise them to avoid dehydration. So when you see patients for their follow-up visit after first starting them on lithium, you also want to test that lithium level. The half-life is about one day, then steady state should occur then in five days. But because of the seriousness of the patient, especially in their manic phase, just go ahead and draw that serum concentration on day three or after any dose change is made to make sure that toxicity is not occurring. Typically, you want to aim for a concentration of 0.8 to 1.2 milliequivalents per liter in acute mania, 0.6 to 1.0 milliequivalent per liter in the maintenance phase. So long-term is 0.6 to 0.8, acute 1 to 1.2, and maintenance right in between 0.8 to 1.0. So what are the symptoms if lithium toxicity is suspected? Well, if it's mild lithium toxicity, its range will be 1.3 to 1.4. The symptoms will be apathy, irritability, lethargy, muscle weakness, and nausea. Uh, you'll just hold a lithium and provide supportive care. Moderate toxicity is defined as 1.5 to 2.5, and the symptoms present would be of blurred vision, confusion, diarrhea, marked tremor, vertigo, and deep tendon reflex. Again, lithium will be held and supportive care given. But if lithium is at high toxic levels, greater than 2.5, at that point, you can see cardiac dysrhythmia, coma, renal failure, seizure, stupor. And at that point, you just want to get them to the ER, and they might actually need hemodialysis. The key takeaway is when you initially see someone in the ER 
for anything and you know they're on lithium, always make sure that lithium level is drawn as the lithium toxicity should be part of the differential diagnosis. When you get the results back, whether it's in the ER or in your office and you find the lithium concentrations are high and you look, then look at the medication list and you might want to look to see if there's any causative agents such as an ACE inhibitor, lisinopril, NSAID, thiazide, or a diuretic that could be causing an increase in lithium concentrations. You can also see subtherapeutic levels of lithium, and that can occur if there's any alteration in their food intake or liquid intake causing dehydration or something that can decrease the GFR. So ask them what, how much they're drinking. What about salty foods? Ask. Let's talk about mood stabilizing anticonvulsants. Dalforperex, also called valproic acid, is just as effective as lithium in the acute phase as well as for prophylactic management. It's good for rapid cyclers, but it may not be as effective in a depressive phase. It's beneficial for patients with dysphoric mania, mixed episodes, or have a history of substance use disorder. The target serum concentrations are 50 to 125 mcg per milliliter. So check that concentration level after three to five days of initiation or change in dose. Low albumin levels increases the risk of free concentration. If there's no response to treatment, this can be common if the dose is just too low. However, the free fraction increases as the serum concentration is too high. With a CERN concentration level greater than 80, you can actually see side effects such as neurotoxicity, sedation, liver failure, hair loss, or thrombocytopenia. Life-threatening pancreatitis can also occur, but it's uncommon. It occurs, though, in about 5% of patients. The second mood-stabilizing anticonvulsant is carpanzepine, also called Tegretol. They can induce their own metabolism, so lower serum levels are better. It could be added to those already on lithium but didn't respond as a monotherapy. It's great for rapid cycling disorders, so good for those with acute mania. Eketro is a newer medication that's FDA-approved for acute manic and mixed episodes. It's a once-a-day controlled-release version of carpanzepine. Next is lamotrigine, a.k.a. Lamictal. This drug is approved for maintenance. It shines by preventing depressive episodes of bipolar disorder. However, it's less effective than other mood stabilizers for preventing a manic phase. Lamictimol has pretty much replaced antidepressants as first-line recommendation in most treatment guidelines for bipolar depression. Oh, but don't forget that it has a black box warning for serious rash. There are two adverse effects that you have to be aware of. The first being Steven Johnson syndrome. It's rare, but potentially life-threatening immune reaction. It occurs in 0.3% of adults and 1% of children. So what are the signs and symptoms of SJS? Well, the signs are facial swelling, tongue swelling, macules, papules, burning rash, skin, slothing, prodromal headache, malaise, arthralgia, and a painful mucous membrane. On Those things can occur even before the rash. If you see a rash, stop the drug immediately and transfer the patient to the hospital, perhaps even with one that has a burn unit. Uh, do not attempt to rechallenge. This can happen even if a rapid titration has occurred or started with a very high dose, or if started in a younger patient. It can also occur when used in conjunction with valproic acid. So to minimize the risk, the dose titration should be cut in half if given with valproate, but doubled if given with carpanzepine. The other adverse effect is from lamictal results in aseptic meningitis. The person will complain of headaches, fever, chills and nausea, vomiting, stiff neck, rash, abnormal sensitivity to light, drowsiness, and or confusion. Symptoms usually occur 1 to 42 days after starting the drug, and these patients might need to be hospitalized. So don't forget that the dose titration must be halved if lamotrigine is given with valproate and doubled if given with carpanzepine because it increases the lamotrigine metabolism. So we've discussed lithium and anticonvulsants. Let's go over to antipsychotics. So antipsychotics, particularly second-generation antipsychotics, have mood-stabilizing properties. They can be used alone or with an anticonvulsant mood stabilizer to treat bipolar symptoms. It can be used for acute treatment of symptoms or psychosis, aggression, and irritation, but they often are combined with a traditional mood stabilizer for severe symptoms. All SGAs have received FDA approval for use in acute mania 
or mixed episodes, except for brexiprazole, clozapine, and iloperidone. For acute mania, the guidelines recommend these variety of medications, such as olanzapine, risperidone, quetanapine, apropazole. When treating bipolar depression, both quetanapine and lurisiridone are FDA-approved for treatment of bipolar depression. Olanzapine paired with loxetine is FDA-approved for bipolar depression. Data for amiprazole suggests it is ineffective for the treatment of bipolar depression. Maintenance treatment involves long-acting injectable antipsychotic formulation risperidol consta and Abilify for use in bipolar maintenance as monotherapy. Another recommended maintenance drug is olanzapine and quetanapine. So where do benzos fall in this treatment plan? Well, in the acute phase with agitation and insomnia and hyperactivity, we can use olanzapine, but they're not useful for preventing relapse or the core symptoms. So it's just as a bridge. Okay, let's talk about some controversial topics. And that is using an antidepressant in bipolar. So it's controversial because there's a potential of switching that person to a manic phase, particularly in patients with type 1 bipolar disorder. The risk appears greater with TCAs and SNRIs than they do with SSRIs or bupropion. Because individual patients with bipolar disorder might benefit from antidepressant, the International Society of Bipolar Disorders stopped short of recommending against any use of antidepressants. However, antidepressants should not be used as a monotherapy, and their use should be minimized in general. So, antidepressants should not be used in bipolar depression if symptoms of mania are present. Trials have found no statistical significant increased episode of depression in patients taking mood stabilizers when discontinuing their antidepressant. Patients with bipolar disorder taking a mood stabilizer who received either paroxetine or propion were no more likely to achieve remission than those receiving placebo. They were also no more likely to switch to a manic phase. In fact, fluoxetine in combination with olanzapine is actually approved to treat depression associated with type 1 bipolar disorder. So what about children and adolescents with bipolar? How do we treat them? Well, the best choice is what works for adults, and that's lithium. Lithium is FDA approved for children ages 12 to 17. So everything so far has been about bipolar type 1, but how do we treat bipolar type 2? Well, uh, we know that the depressive phase tends to be more debilitating, but in the hypomanic phase, they are usually functional. So treatment really needs to focus on the depressive phase. Lithium is first line agent to be used, but it might not achieve remission as a monotherapy and it will take time to relieve the symptoms. So in the acute phase, quetanapine is preferred. Lurisiridone is an alternative, but not as common. Lamotrine is another alternative, but because it's so slow, because that slow titration schedule, it's not for acute treatment, just for long-term control. Other mood stabilizers can be used, but it may not be as efficacious as they are in type 1 bipolar. What is used more in bipolar type 2, though, are antidepressants. But, of course, you need to be given with caution and still never as monotherapy. The combination of fluoxetine with olanzapine is used as it was used in bipolar type 1, as said before. So medication is the mainstay in treatment of bipolar disorder, but there is a non-pharmacological approach, and that will show up on your test. But during the acute phase, especially with a manic episode, you really want to just monitor them. You want to help them. You want to meet their needs for nutrition, sleep, rest. You want to make sure that they stay safe. Remember SI. So the non-pharmacological psychotherapy, you know, that's when they're not as much in the acute phase. You do an inpatient on the milieu, you want to make sure you maintain a nice structured, safe environment. You do want a certain type of social socialization and interpersonal support, all while providing independence for that patient. You want to identify strategies for living with the illness, with the patient and their family. Therapies that can be used are cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal therapy. Those help prevent long-term relapse, but it is ineffective when treating manic episodes. Other treatments include electroconvulsive therapy in resistant cases or cases that are extremely severe. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is another option that is used. Um, That's used in magnetic waves and is less powerful than ECT, but it can be done without general anesthesia. Well, good luck on your test. I hope you do well. Don't forget to check out one of my other videos to learn more about bipolar disorder.